Good morning. Y'all are a lively group this morning. I love it. So welcome to First Baptist Maysville as everybody's finding their seat. Um, we're glad you're here this morning. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and stand and join us in worship for our first song this morning. Be seated. How is everybody doing this morning? Okay, oh, let's start over. How's everybody doing this morning? There we go. Woo! Well, we just want to give you a warm welcome this morning to First Baptist Maysville, whether it's your first time today or whether you've been here 500 times. We are glad that you are here. And I just want to open up with a verse, um, and that is Psalm 122, verse 1. And it says this, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. How many people are glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. And really quick, um, before we get into some announcements, I just want us to say our mission statement together really quick on the count of three. Um, your cheat sheet is on the screen. One, two, three. Our mission is to increasingly know and love Jesus Christ and to continually make him known to all people. And so I have just a few announcements really quick for us. Number one um, is that in light of Miss Francis turning 39 for the, is it the 40th time? Being 90 years old today, um, we will not be having discipleship training tonight, um, but if you know Miss Francis, have her cell phone number, make sure to text her and just tell her happy birthday that you're so grateful for her. She's um, such a, or her birthday's Tuesday, my fault, but her birthday's Tuesday, so text her Tuesday and tell her how excited you are, and also Andrea Horn's birthday is today, and Donald Green's. Can we just say to everybody on the count of three, one, two, three, happy birthday. 
There we go. Oh, thank you, Ella Grace. I appreciate that. Um, one awesome thing, too, that we have coming up in our church is that on October 26th, the men of this church, along with their children if they want to bring them, their young boys and young men, are going to Bush Gardens to have the time of their life. Any roller coaster fans in here? Nobody? Well, this is going to be a terrible event. No, I'm just <laughs> No, I know you love them, so make sure you get up with Andrew just to RSVP so we know how many people are going. We're going to go to Bush Gardens and have an awesome time. It was a blast last year, so make sure you come out to that. Um, and then also next weekend is actually one of the biggest weekends of the year for us. We're having our homecoming weekend next weekend. And let me tell you, if you have not been at our church since last homecoming, if you've never seen a homecoming, it is one of the best weekends of the year because all of the people in our church who can cook, guess what? They cook. And you walk into the fellowship hall and there's this huge line of food that is so delicious and so good. So next weekend, make sure you're here for that. It'll actually be our 100th homecoming. Is that not awesome? Yes. And so bring your favorite dish for that. But then also, we're getting into prime time here as a church because our Community Appreciation Day is coming up November 2nd, um, and we're going to need all sorts of help for that. So make sure you keep your eye out um, for ways to volunteer. We'll have sign-up sheets and everything like that coming to you soon, so be ready for that. And then also, we're actually going to be ordering um, some t-shirts and some hats for that. And so right now, actually, there's a QR code that just popped up here on the screen. Um, so if anybody wants to pull out their phone, if anybody wants a t-shirt or a hat, I will give you like 10 whole Mississippis to be able to pull out your phone, scan that QR code, um, and submit a form for a t-shirt or a hat for Mississippi, five Mississippi. And just a reminder, whenever you do so, for each individual t-shirt or each individual hat that somebody needs, for each individual in your family, um, make sure you fill out a separate form. So if you have kids, fill out a separate form for them, one for yourself, et cetera, et cetera. Awesome. So that's going to be an awesome time. And then, obviously, um, there is a reality that the um, western part of our state um, and many other parts of the country um, have been affected um, by terrible flooding um, and a terrible storm. And so we're going to spend some time in prayer for that in just a moment. Um, but I want to give you a couple ways that you can get involved. Um, Baptist on Mission actually does a lot of work sending people to that part of the state um, or to any area that's been affected by a disaster. If you want to get involved with that, um, Donald Meadows, can you raise your hand? Yes. Please see Donald Meadows, and he'll be um, just collecting names for that if anybody's interested in getting involved um, and helping bring disaster relief. But then also, our Baptist Association on October 19th from 10 to 12 um, is actually hosting um, an opportunity for kids. It's focused on kid, kids age um, first grade through sixth grade, but they're going to be packing disaster relief kits, actually, um, that'll likely go to help um, this relief effort, and they're actually going to have somebody from the disaster relief team there to speak and encourage the kids. So if you have kids that age, or really kids any age, um, feel free to come out to that on October 19th. Miss Billy Jordan, are you here? If you need any more information on that, please see Miss Billy Jordan right over there. But um, as we close this time of announcements, I would love for us, just everybody with heads bowed, um, to just take a time, just take a moment, and just pray um, for all the disaster that our nation has seen recently, that our state has seen, and just pray for relief. Pray for the comfort of God and the strength of God during this time. Almighty God, by your word, you laid the foundations of the earth. You set the bounds of the sea, and you are the one who stills the wind and the waves. We ask, God, that you would 
surround all the people affected by this storm with your grace and your peace, that you would preserve them by your spirit, that you would lift up those who have fallen, that you would strengthen those who work to rescue or rebuild these areas. And I pray, Lord, that you would fill us in this time with the reality of the hope that we have in your new creation. In the midst of a broken world, I pray, Lord, that you would put in our hearts hope for the future. And I ask God today that you would be with Brandon as he brings the word, that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate your word and you would help us to receive insight and wisdom from it, that we would be led to follow you in ways that we never have before. Strengthen us, Lord, and I ask God that our worship today would be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. And now if you want to stand up, Miss Cheryl is going to lead us in our call to worship this morning. We're going to be reading Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valleys of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Amen. Let's worship together.
reasons why I'll praise you anywhere Every promise, God, goodness, every step Each and every breath I'll praise you anywhere Faithful all my life Blessings day and night Countless reasons why I'll praise you anywhere Every promise, God, goodness, every step Each and every breath Give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy. Yes, he is worthy of all of the praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy. Yes, he. Who will 
I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why trust. Lord, when everything around us is shaky and uncertain, God, you are a solid and firm foundation. And we can look to your word, Father, to find strength and security and peace and safety, love, forgiveness, grace, mercy, everything that we need, God, we can find in your word. And so, God, I pray as we study it today, Lord, as we dive in, and that you would speak to our hearts, Father, that you would lead us in the way that you would have us to go, Father. And deepen our trust in you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It is an honor and a privilege uh, every time I get an opportunity to, to speak before you all and to, uh, to go through the Word of God. Um, today we're going to be in Psalm 119, and I think, Jonathan, you brought the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for everybody for lunch today, uh, 176 verses, longest chapter in the Bible. We should get out, hopefully by supper time. If not, we'll bring in more PB&J. Um, so, but it, it is interesting though, Psalm 119, if you want to go ahead and turn there, um, unfortunately there is no way, no way in the world I could cover the entire chapter and the time that I have here and do it justice. But I do think that one of the things that we're going to see with Psalm 119 is something that is, it is repetitive, but not redundant. There's a difference. And the difference being repetition is good, redundancy not necessarily. Repetition is very good. It takes repetition to get good at something. It's the reason why baseball players, football players, basketball players throw hundreds of passes, run hundreds of routes, or shoot thousands of free throws or, or whatever, because repetition is important to know how to do something, including the Word of God, not necessarily to know how to do the Word of God, but in a way, kind of knowing how to live out what God has, has instructed us to do. And that is entirely what Psalm 119 is all about. Psalm 119 is all about God's Word. Now, when we 
have this time here. We call this a time of reading and preaching God's Word. But today we're going to be preaching God's Word about God's Word. But again, it is not redundant. It is extremely important for us. So just to give you a little bit of, of background on Psalm 119, the entire focus of Psalm 119, all 176 verses, with the exception of some scholars say two verses, others say about four or five, every verse in this scripture minus a few mention in some way the word of God, whether it be his precepts, his statutes, his commandments, various, uh, his law, the Torah, different things. This entire book of scripture or this entire chapter of scripture focuses on God's word. Traditional scholars suggest the psalm was actually written by King David over the entire course of his life. Um, more recent scholars, more modern scholars suggest the psalm was actually a post-exilic post -exilic psalm written during the time of Ezra the scribe. Some say that it was a psalm that was written by David but then assembled at a later date in the form that we have it here today. We're not told who the author of this psalm is. Regardless of who the author is, most scholars believe that this psalm was assembled over a long period of time and ultimately becoming what we have today, a singular focused psalm, song, or poem on the Word of God. Now, it is not necessarily a song or a poem that we typically see in the Psalms. It doesn't carry with it a meter, per se, where it would be necessarily set to music. The Psalm is actually an acrostic poem. Now, if you don't know what that is, it's basically you take a letter and go from top to bottom, and every one of the eight verse stanzas begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Starting with, if I do not pronounce this correctly, I have not studied Hebrew and I apologize. Aleph, which would be equivalent to our A, and ending with Ta, equivalent to our Z. Or maybe you've heard it this way. In Greek, it would be the Alpha and the Omega. It's an acrostic poem that goes... From beginning to the end of the Hebrew alphabet. Now we have been working our way through the Psalms over the last, y'all believe this, 25 weeks together going through studying the Psalms together as a church in the, uh, in the book that a lot of you all sitting here helped assemble. We have experienced the highs and the lows that the people of Israel experienced as we've gone through this. From their freedom from the bondage of Egypt to the conquest of their enemies and godly rule under the leadership of King David, to the realization that though David was a great king and a man after God's own heart, he himself was not the Messiah, and he was in fact imperfect. And in need of God's forgiveness, to the falling away of Solomon, and ultimately to the falling away of the entire nation of Israel, to the eventual exile experienced in Babylon, but ultimately being brought back out of exile from Babylon, back into the land of promise. It has been a roller coaster of events. But boy, isn't that fitting for life. You know, don't we experience that in life? As we go through life, things come up, things happen, they, they trip us up, and we get, we get led astray to do things that we shouldn't do. Then we, we find in God's Word we, we're brought back into the fold. But we have seen in the Psalms and throughout the history of God's people this one resounding theme, and it is this. God is good, and His steadfast love endures forever. But you know, Psalm 119 is a little different. We'll actually get to it in a minute. <laughs> Psalm 119 does not focus nearly as much on God's steadfast love for us directly as much as it does our need to follow, follow after the ways of God over and over and over. This psalm is our reminder of how crucial it is 
that we cherish and revere the Word of God. Now, sometimes I feel like I lose sight of exactly what the Word of God is. I mean, I have, I've been going to church since nine months before I was born, right? I have owned one of these since I was, before I could talk, before I could read or even know anything. I have read this book over the last 39 years of my life. But sometimes I think I forget exactly what the Word of God is. Now, forgive these words. They're going to be unfamiliar to you as they were to me and still are to some degree. But in this, in this passage of Psalm 119, throughout the 176 verses that comprise it, the Word of God is, is called several things in Hebrew throughout this, throughout this scripture. Colt, you'll, you'll have to correct me on how I mispronounce this stuff. I've tried. Anyway, but the first is the spoken word or God's revealed word, the Debar or Imrah. Maybe. That's one, that's one of, the, of the words that is used for the Word of God in this psalm. The spoken word or God's revealed word. Then there's the Torah. I'm a little more familiar with that one. right? We've heard that before. That is the law or the revelation of the law that is also mentioned here. The mispatim or the judgments allowing us to discern what is right and wrong. The idut or idat which is basically a reference to the loyalty between the Lord and Israel based on God's covenant. And then there, there's the miswa, which is orders from God or his direct commandments. And then there's the hukim, or the written word of God, and the pikadim, which are specific particular instructions that God, God gives. All of these are part of this scripture. So when I was studying for this and reading up on that, it started... You know, I'm, I'm from a little community called Gregory Fork, North Carolina, okay? I don't, this right here, it don't hit pay dirt with me necessarily. But here's what does. What does all of that and all of this mean for somebody like me? Here's what it is. The word of God is this. It is God's Revelation of himself, wherever you're from, Gregory Fort, Maysville, New Bern, Jacksonville, it don't matter. The word of God is God's revelation of himself to humanity. To every one of us in here, in so many different ways, his commandments, his law, his nature, his kindness, his grace, his mercy, his peace. And when we discover that the word of God that is spoken of here in this psalm is his very revelation to you and me of himself, it makes all the difference. All of a sudden, we're not just reading words on a page and this book that is printed on the same type of paper that every other book is printed begins to carry with it much more weight and importance. And it deserves our attention and it deserves our reverence. It deserves our time. It deserves our effort. When we begin to view God's word as a means of us actually knowing God and understanding his character, understanding his mercy and his grace, we begin to see how precious this word is. So if you will, let's read Psalm 119, verses 1 through 176. Just kidding. Verses 1 through 8 as we begin. Stand with me, if you will, as we read. Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8. Aleph, blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. 
that I would not be put to shame when I consider all of your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that in this time, God, that every one of us in here would develop in ourselves a new appreciation for your word. That it is not just your word, but it is, a, it is an avenue to usher us into your very presence. Into your very presence both now and for eternity. This is how we get to know you, Lord. It's through your word. And how precious it is. And how often I take it for granted. Shame on me for that. Forgive me, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that everything that is said and, and done here today, every word that is spoken, Lord, would be from you and not from me. And that your name would be glorified in it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So the writer of the psalm begins the first part of the psalm with a declaration. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless who walk according to the law of the Lord. But as he continues into the stanza of, of this psalm, into this first stanza, we start to see the writer get a little more personal. Not blessed is the one, but then he starts to focus in on himself. We began to see his own personal desire to follow after God's precepts and God's commands. Now, why is that? What, what is going on here that would cause this person to go from the generic, blessed is the one, or blessed are those who are blameless, blessed are those who keep his statutes, to now turning the lens and focusing in on himself? And it's all because the writer strives for a closer relationship personally to God. Do you know that the nation of Israel, um, most likely before this was actually assembled, probably you know, during the time of David and, and, and then leading up into the time of Solomon and then into after Solomon's reign, the nation of Israel had fallen away from God. They had disobeyed God. But you know where it starts? We can look out at this world that we live in. It's no different than today. We can look out at this world and we can look out at this country. And we can talk about how bad everything around us is. But do you know where the change actually starts? And politicians will tell you it's with the next elected official. We got an election coming up, and they'll tell you to vote for me. I'll set you free. Vote for me, and we'll, we'll make everything better. We'll make everything right. But do you know where change really happens? Right here. In me and in you. It doesn't happen collectively as a group until it first happens here in my heart. It's got to start here. And the writer understood that it was all about himself becoming closer to God. The goal here also is not just to follow the statutes of the Lord. The goal is not checking off the boxes. The goal in following the rules and the commandments of God is to draw nearer to God. Not just to, not just to check a box. Jesus addressed this in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 17 through 20. Jesus says this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all this is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes on one of the, the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. 
But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, now this is where it rubber meets the road. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What's interesting about who Jesus is talking about in the scribes and Pharisees is they were the ones who were checking all the boxes. They weren't like the common folk like myself who, who kind of recognized that, you know, I ain't got it all together. But the Pharisees were the ones that everyone else looked to on how they should behave, how they should act, the rules they should follow. And Jesus says, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. In Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 13, Isaiah writes this, And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me, the fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Basically, he was saying in that is that their hearts, they, yeah, they're checking all the boxes, but their heart is far from me. They're doing it just because they're being told to and to avoid persecution from the religious leaders who were basically teaching them to do what they were doing. The goal of the word of God and keeping God's commandments, the goal has never been to check the box, but it has been from the beginning closeness to God. Fellowship with the one who created us and everything that we see and everything that we take for granted in this world. How do we achieve this fellowship with God? By walking daily in his word. Fellowship, you know, fellowship comes with time spent together. You can be married and never have fellowship. You can ask Christ to come into your heart, but if you do not surrender yourself to him and spend time in his word and spend time in prayer and spend time with the Lord, then you will not have the fellowship with him that you were designed to have through Jesus Christ. It's not merely checking a box, but enjoying God's presence, getting to know him through his word. Beginning in the second stanza of Psalm 119, Psalm 119 and verse 9, it says this. Beth, be. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. You probably all know this one. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount and all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. In order to walk closely with God, we must obey his word. To obey his word, you have to know what his word says. To know what his word says, we must spend time in his word. You see, it's, a, it's an argument, right? That you're setting up the cause and effect here. To know what his word says, we must spend time in God's word. But it cannot simply be a head knowledge of what the word says to do and not to do. It must be from a desire to know God and to please God. Let's take a step back for a minute. Let's look at the, the very beginning. All the way to the beginning. As we begin to see God's word take action. This will, we're going to be all the way in the beginning. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. And Taylor, I'm going to go ahead and apologize. We're going to be moving kind of quick on this one. Okay, So uh, it might just be better for you to just kind of hang in there with me. And, uh, and just pay attention as we go on this little ride together. Genesis 1. 1 through 2 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And now after this verse, beginning in verse 3, we begin to see God's word move. Genesis 1, 3. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And then moving into Genesis 1, 6. 
And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And then verse 7 ends, and it was so. Verse 9, and God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let dry land appear. And it was so. Verse 11, and God, said, and God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. Verse 14, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate day from the night. And verse 15 ends, and it was so. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. And verse 21 ends, and God saw that it was good. Verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kind. And it ends with it was so. And verse 25 said, and God saw that it was good. And in verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And in the end of the chapter, in verse 31, and God saw, God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. Do you, did you see the roller coaster? And, and when God said, things began to happen. Things began to change. The expanse, the, 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 the surface of the deep, the, the earth was formless and void and in darkness. And then God begins to speak and light appears. And then water appears and then land appears. And then the creation, the, the, the plants and the birds and the, and the creatures that crawl on the ground, everything began to appear. And all of a sudden this void, formless, shapeless piece of ground we call earth is now teeming with life and light. All because of God's Word. The God's Word changes everything. And in Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, it says this, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That was the word of God spoken to Adam. I'm going to make an argument here. You can disagree with me if you'd like. But you do know God in effect here gives Adam the fullness of the law. Isn't that interesting? The only command he gave him was not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But in effect, he gave him nearly the fullness of the law. And that is, obey God. Everything else hinges on that one command. Obey God. God is saying to Adam, trust me. Walk with me. Listen to me. Have fellowship with me. Love me above everything else. Especially yourself. That was the command given to the man, given to Adam by God. And we know what happens in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. It says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. They were given the command by God. And they disobeyed. 
The serpent deceived the man and the woman. But you know, he did it by catering undoubtedly to a fleshly desire that already existed. The desire for knowledge and power already existed. It just took a little nudge to make them take that step. Don't we find ourselves there a lot? You know, we, I mean, the Apostle Paul did. And we do it all the time. We chose to put aside the Word of God. They chose to put aside the Word of God. And we choose to put aside the Word of God and His commands for the command of ourselves. We become our own God. The final authority in my life is me. Me and me alone. We see it in our culture. We see it in our society. Whatever makes you happy, it's all relative to you. You're the boss. No one can tell you what is right or wrong. Unfortunately, that is a lie straight from the pit of hell. And in Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 through 24, it says this, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Do you understand? God did this for us out of love. He drove us, he drove us out of the garden, drove humanity out of the garden away from his presence because God's presence cannot exist in the presence of sin. And he drove us away from the tree of life because he knew that if we had entered into his presence at that time, we would have been cursed forever. So he drove us away for our own good so we wouldn't be banished forever in our sin. But God's purpose for his word has always been for us, humanity, to have a relationship with him and ultimately to come back to him, and he made a way for us to do that through Jesus Christ. The psalmist in Psalm 119 is coming back to the beginning of it all and is saying, what can I do to obey God? How do I get back to that place of fellowship with God that my soul desires, that my spirit aches for? Psalm 119.11 says, by storing up the word of God in my heart, that I might not sin against you, Lord. The Apostle Paul in the Word of God, Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, describes the struggle. He says this, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. The psalmist said, I hide your words in my heart. And I do try to hide his words in my heart, and I long to obey them, but I fail miserably every single day, time after time. I rejoice in following the statutes of the Lord, but sometimes my flesh just wins out. And, over, and my flesh overcomes my spirit, or overcomes my soul. The Apostle Paul continues his words and the struggle in Romans 7, 24 when he says this, Wretched man that I am. That's the Apostle Paul saying that. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? The answer is the Word of God. Let's go to Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112. And the word of God says this, none. I guess that would maybe N would be our letter. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. 
Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Through the word of God, I do not have to walk this dark and weary road that I have stumbled upon and that I continue to stumble in. The word of God takes us back. It resets us. It starts us over. Only this time, we see later in the word of God with a new perspective on the creation story. And this will be in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. The Word of God says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then skipping down to verse 9, it says this, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of, one, of the one and only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word of God sets us free. God was not content to leave us outside of the garden in our sin. But through the fulfillment of His Word, the laws, the prophets, the commandments, God has provided for us His very own Son to live the perfect life required of me to uphold all of the Word of God. And offering Himself, Jesus offering Himself as the perfect substitute for you and me on the cross of Calvary so that I can once again enter into the garden of God. Into God's very presence with my debt paid. In freedom song, singing, Hosanna, save me. Psalm 1846 says, The Lord lives and blessed be my rock and exalted be the God of my salvation. No longer is the flaming sword preventing me from fellowship with God and keeping me out of the garden of God. But through Jesus Christ, I can enter into his very presence as as one set free. Entering into the, the very one who set creation in motion. The only sword remaining is the word of God itself. Ephesians 6, 17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Hebrews 4, 12 also refers to the word of God as a sword. For the word of God is living and active Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And Psalm 119 closes with this in verses 169 through 176. Tall or Z. May my cry come before you, Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. May my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your promise. May my lips overflow with praise. For you teach me your decrees. May my tongue sing of your word. For all your commands are righteous. May your hand be ready to help me. For I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, Lord. And your law gives me delight. Let me live that I may praise you. And may your laws sustain me. I have strayed like a lost sheep. Seek your servant. For I have not forgotten your commands. Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 8 says this. The grass withers. The flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. I am like the grass. I am like the flower. One day, this little tent that I'm staying in, it's going to pass away. But I'm promised a tomorrow that never ends. I'm promised an eternity with the one who died for me. Revelation 22, 13 through 14 says this. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. The same tree of life that we were banished from at the very beginning. The same tree of life that when we sin, God had to, had to keep us from so that we would not live forever in our sin. We now have access to through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. All it takes is for us to call on His name. Ask Him into your heart today. Christian, if you've known the Lord for a long time, but you find yourself not spending the time with Him, not having the fellowship with Him that you desire to have, today's the day for a new commitment. And understand this from Matthew chapter 28. At the end of verse 20, Jesus says, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And the word of God closes in this way. He who testifies to these things. Revelation 22 verses 20 through 21. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. And I will close as scripture closes. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, your word is so precious and so special. Lord, it points, it points us to you. It shows us your character. It shows us your love, your compassion, your grace, your mercy. Lord, I pray that we also find our eternity in it today. That you have provided a way of escape, Lord. I pray that we see just how precious your word is and that we, that we spend time in it so that we can begin our fellowship. Our fellowship with you does not begin in eternity. It starts today. Lord, I pray if someone here doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior that today would be their day of salvation. And I pray that we all examine ourselves to grow closer to you through your word. How precious it is in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God spoke and it was. He said, let there be light and there was light. He said, let there be the sun, there was the sun and it was good. The only difference between you and the light, the only difference between you and the sun and the moon and the stars is this. They have to obey God. You get a choice. And so today, as we respond in worship, I encourage you to surrender your heart and your life to what God has spoken. To disobey God's word is to disobey God. And so today, as we respond, let's respond with humility and repentance, running to the feet of Jesus. Amen? Let's stand and let's worship.
your sorrow and your sadness. There's a Savior and He calls. Bring it all to the table. He can see that weight you carry. And the fears that hold your Accepted as you are. So bring it all to the table. It's nothing he ain't seen before. For all your trials, all your worries, and your burdens, there's a Savior. Bring it all to the table. Bring it all. You can bring it all. So come on in, take your place. There's no some praise.